Namaste. So coming back after a few days off, and I want to talk about chapter 17 of Lakshmi Tantra. This chapter is extremely important from a structural point of view in revealing Lakshmi's purpose. Why is she narrating this extensive explanation to Indra, of all people? Indra's job is mostly fighting, <laughs> but he's also a spiritual leader and he has to know how things work so that he can uh, manage and encourage the sages in the, in the right way and also the other demigods and kings under his rule. But there's something even deeper than that. If we really step back and take a look at the whole of Lakshmi Tantra, the whole first section, the first 15 chapters are basically about cosmogony. How is the universe created? What are all the complex mechanisms and the deities and shaktis behind its construction? Now, why do we need to know about that? Isn't it kind of, you know, above our job description, <laughs> above our pay grade to know about all that stuff? Isn't it really none of our business, how the universe is created or how it's put together? Well, if we look ahead a few chapters, in the very next chapter, starting with chapter 18 through about 25, she starts talking about the Matrika. Remember the Matrika from our series, Mysteries of the Matrika? It's basically the Sanskrit alphabet. And she's discussing the meaning and the potency of each letter. And basically what she's saying, the, the big view or the, the summary, the, the elevator pitch, huh, is that each letter of the Sanskrit alphabet represents and conducts one of the potencies or several of the potencies involved in creating the universe. Now, this is extremely profound because the very next thing she talks about after chapter 24, 25 is mantras. And of course, the mantras are composed of the letters of the alphabet. And the letters of the alphabet correspond to the various agencies and expansions and potencies of creation. So in other words, a mantra is a creative tool. As we have been talking about since the very beginning of this channel, the spiritual path, the process of self-realization is a process of becoming. And what is becoming? Creation. So a mantra, in other words, is a verbal formula that creates a certain kind of being so that we can become something more than what we are today. In fact, we become ultimately equal in quality and potency with Brahman. So these mantras are pretty potent. They're not to be trifled with. They are this very same sounds that are used to create the, the universe. But in, sandwiched in the middle of these two big sections on um, the cosmogony and then the alphabet and the mantras made from it is these two little chapters, 16 and 17, on the four paths of self-realization, the four methods of enlightenment. Now, what a coincidence. <laughs> that she just happens to mention four paths of enlightenment 
just exactly the same as Shankaracharya, just the same as Ramana Maharshi, huh? just the same as we've been teaching here for years now, although very few people have really understood this teaching, as far as I can tell, there are four levels or stages of spiritual sadhana leading to enlightenment. And in chapter 16, she goes through the first three of them. And they are basically karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and raja yoga, just as we've been teaching. So this totally confirms our views. Well, not our views, but the views of the great acharyas like Shankara and Ramana. So we feel very much supported and confirmed by Lakshmi's revelations here. And of course, I always forget to mention, if you haven't watched chapter 16 and chapter 17 uh, narration, you should do that, you know, <laughs> before watching this video, because you really won't have the background or context to understand all the points I'm making here. So anyway, she talks about karma yoga, which means the Varnashram Dharma and the religious rituals connected with it. And then she talks about temple worship and so on, which is bhakti. And finally, she, she mentions in passing, doesn't even really describe the yoga system because it's already been well explained by Patanjali and others in other tantras and agamas. So then, why does she leave the last one, the fourth one, for chapter 17? And the whole of 17 is about nothing but the fourth way. Another reference for those of you who are hip to Gurdjieff. The fourth way is neither action nor inaction. It's neither pious nor sinful. It's neither being a doer or being the cause of the results of sadhana. What is it? Self-surrender, sharanagati, prapati. Huh? So what does this mean? It means, well, there's a nice example given about the difference between the baby monkey and the baby cat, kittens. The baby monkey, we see them all the time here. Uh, they have to cling to the mother, either in the front or in the back. And you know, monkeys, they're always jumping, climbing things, doing incredible acrobatics, hanging by their tails. I mean, they're wild things, you know? So the poor baby monkey is like hanging on, literally, for dear life. And this, of course, takes a tremendous amount of effort. And this is compared to the paths of sadhana, uh, like karma yoga and the formal aspect of bhakti, temple worship, and the path of yoga. You know, they're all acts of will and they require the conception of a doer, which is the ego, of course, and desire. I want to become self-realized and so on like this. But the other kind of surrender is the surrender of the kitten. The kitten doesn't do anything, but when the mother comes, mother cat comes and grabs him by his scruff of his neck. <laughs> if you've seen it, huh? The, cat, the kitten just goes limp. He just lets his mother take him wherever she wants, trusting that she knows what's best for him. So this is the kind of devotion. I get so ecstatic just thinking about the breadth and depth of her compassion I mean, if you read in 17, uh, 16 rather, she goes to Vishnu Narayan 
And she says, you know, I really feel for these poor human beings stuck in the samsara. You know, what can we do for them? And Narayan says, well, it's nothing, you know, we already made the paths of the Vedas and the paths of temple worship and the path of yoga. It's all there in the scriptures. You know, they can, they can just read those scriptures and they'll be all right. But that's not enough for her. She has to take it a step further. And she has to create her own method which anybody can perform. Because to perform the karma yoga and bhakti yoga and raja yoga is very, very difficult. Practically speaking, in Kali Yuga, it's impossible. And of course, we have been very critical of people trying to sell the idea that you can just jump up to meditation, raja yoga, without any prior qualifications. This is not supported in Shastra at all. But anyway, these first three paths are practically impossible these days. So what does mother do? She makes a special dispensation. And to just to compress it all into the money quote, anyone who chants my name, I give the knowledge that leads to liberation. Now, I don't expect anybody to believe this, and I don't think she does either. <laughs> that it's so easy huh, to be like the kitten. Huh? The kitten is crying. Meow, ma, ma. <laughs> So mother comes, picks up the kitten, and takes him to the nest, to safety. So similarly, if we call out her name, any of her names, <laughs> or even the names of Vishnu, her consort, any of his many, many names, then she arranges, somehow or other, with her powers to deliver us. See, this is mother. This is care. This is compassion. She is making everything so easy. <laughs> All we have to do is chant this little mantra. Huh? Now she says, it's simple, but it's not easy. And you can verify this by taking any mantra, even Aum. Huh? very simple mantra, and just try to meditate on it without deviation for even five minutes. And you'll see how your mind is jumping all over the place, <laughs> like the monkey. So instead of being like the baby monkey and trying to hold on to it and control it by will, if we just surrender to her and say, okay, Ma, I put my whole uh, future and my life and my being in your hands. And Ma, Ma, whatever name we use, huh? that's one of her names, by the way, Ma, that please arrange everything for my liberation, then she will surely do it. I'm speaking from experience. I tried all those other paths. I did my years of temple worship. I did my years of bhakti. I did even my years of meditation in a stone cottage up in the mountains of Sri Lanka. And you can see that cottage in some of our earlier videos. And I got glimpses of the absolute, but I didn't get a permanent realization. But by chanting her name the last two and a half years, since I got initiated into Sri Vidya, I've been chanting her name, the Mahashodashi Mantra. And these are, Lakshmi Tantra will confirm that the bijas used in the Mahashodashi Mantra are indeed the highest and most powerful and most likely to grant liberation. 
So simply by chanting these in the last two and a half years, my life has improved in every way, not only spiritually, also materially. And she will explain everything about how that works in the later chapters, really coming up quite soon. So I want to confirm from my own experience that, how can I say, the lower three methods, karma, bhakti, and raja yoga, are necessary prerequisites but not sufficient to grant liberation. Not in the age of Kali, because we cannot perform them perfectly. And if we don't perform them perfectly, they don't give the result. But this method of prapati, this method of sharanagati, because of Mother's special mercy, is sure to draw us inexorably towards complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.